Okay, so we now we'll have this uh, round, this second and final uh, round table to uh, conclude this uh, two days uh, symposium. And uh, initially, I uh, thought that uh, this uh, round table could think about the role of the international community and advanced economies in particular in the reduction of global poverty. Of course, I had in mind uh, that we should focus at the same stage on uh, the issue of aid, which has already been alluded to uh, brilliantly by uh, Stefan. Uh, but at, at the same time, I think that uh, we can be much more general <coughs> in, uh, two, in two ways. The first way that I noticed that during this uh, day and a half, we didn't talk too much about uh, the uh, external constraint on development and uh, the uh, role that uh, globalization is uh, playing, uh, the uh, role that, I mean, not only in terms of uh, trade, in terms of uh, the uh, allocation, the ge geographical allocation of uh, uh, production or economic activity in the world, uh, the uh, role that globalization may play through migration, through uh, uh, capital uh, uh, flows. And this is definitely, we know that, a very, very important element of the context in which uh, developing countries, uh, and developed countries as a matter of fact, but uh, in the developing countries certainly uh, have to uh, 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 function. So uh, I thought that maybe this uh, round table could uh, if uh, this is uh, uh, in, in the mind of the panelists, maybe uh, uh, look at uh, a little to, to, to those issues. And uh, at the same time, uh, we certainly have not uh, covered all uh, the uh, issues of importance uh, in the round table yesterday. Several issues came to uh, the forefront in the presentations that we had today. And uh, if the panelists want to insist on uh, some of this aspect, which is not directly aid, which is not directly uh, uh, trade or uh, globalization, uh, they are, of course, uh, most welcome to, to, to do it. So let me uh, start by uh, simply focusing on uh, uh, the role of the international community, say uh, a few words, uh, ask a few questions or make a few remarks, uh, uh, and then I'll pass on the, uh, the floor to uh, the uh, other panelists. Uh, okay, I think that uh, aid is probably for many, for the poorest developing countries at least, is certainly a very important uh, uh, element uh, in uh, their uh, development. And in particular, we have to be aware of the fact that aid may be one of the few levers available for the international community, possibly to influence development in some countries. There are not so many levers. This may be one. I'm not sure that uh, it is very effective, and there is a, a, a very a hot debate to some extent about whether aid may be effective or not. But uh, we certainly cannot say uh, or ignore that uh, possible uh, uh, lever. Um, now, in theory, and uh, in the presentation by uh, Stefan, there was this uh, uh, mention of uh, the position by uh, Jeff Sachs, uh, which is basically to say that uh, aid can be used to uh, uh, finance uh, uh, the accumulation of uh, assets uh, for the whole country, for uh, uh, poor people uh, in particular, <laughs> that uh, aid may be the only way to get out of a macro poverty trap, aid may be uh, uh, the only way you can uh, give to an economy a big push in order to get out of the poverty trap. We know all these uh, arguments. Uh, we are not, uh, we don't find them always completely convincing. And uh, uh, it is certainly the case that uh, all of uh, the aid that has been uh, distributed over the, the past, and even in the recent past, uh, has not been uh, as, as, as effective. And uh, uh, maybe the dominant uh, uh, view these days is to insist on the disappointing result of, of aid. And you have this argument, a la Bill Easterly, uh, which uh, says, look, we have uh, spent, uh, if I remember well, my last calculation was uh, $4,000 billion 
in uh, aid over the last uh, 50 years without uh, capitalizing, without uh, uh, using any kind of uh, discount rate. And uh, uh, yet, and this is the Billy study argument, uh, poverty is still uh, affecting 1.3 uh, million billion people and uh, uh, almost 3 billion people when you <laughs> take the $2 a day uh, poverty line. So because of that, aid is uh, ineffective. Of course, this argument is really not very convincing. Uh, we would like to know what the counterfactual is. Uh, maybe there would be 5 billion people, poor people in the world without any aid. But uh, probably I'm, I'm very optimistic uh, here about uh, the effectiveness of aid, but uh, certainly we'd like to, 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 to know that. Now, uh, but there are uh, reasons why we uh, may expect aid to uh, uh, be uh, possibly an adjuvant <coughs> to growth, but uh, a difficult one to, uh, to, to manage. And also uh, uh, many people insist on the uh, counterproductive role of aid. And uh, in uh, the, the last book by uh, Angus Deaton called The Great Escape, the, the last chapter is a, a very uh, strong critique of, uh, of, of aid, uh, where a couple of uh, arguments are being developed, in particular this argument that uh, 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 aid is uh, uh, feeding uh, corruption, that uh, aid is uh, uh, not, uh, uh, is, is uh, producing some opacity of, uh, the, uh, of uh, economic management in a country because uh, uh, governments uh, are uh, accountable not so much to their uh, uh, population, but they are accountable uh, to uh, donors, uh, that is to the people who are providing uh, funds. When you are in a country where uh, donors are responsible for uh, 25 or 30 percent of the whole budget, which is not uncommon, uh, it is clear that uh, 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 you may have uh, this kind of issue, and uh, the fact that uh, the government is not accountable with respect to its own population, uh, because uh, as uh, uh, Paul was uh, saying, uh, 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 talking about uh, uh, the uh, rent from natural resources, uh, because of that there is definitely a, a lack of uh, 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 transparency in the, whole, in the whole economy, which is uh, inimical to, uh, to, to development. So, Definitely, there are uh, uh, negative aspects in aid. Uh, there is a potential, which is uh, the funding uh, potential. And uh, I don't think that we can throw the baby uh, out uh, uh, with the, the, the bathwater. Uh, there is something to be done with aid. Uh, we must uh, be able to improve the way in which it is delivered. Uh, Maybe uh, the, uh, the, the way in which it is delivered can be improved along the lines of uh, the uh, European Commission, which is uh, for some time has tried to promote uh, result-based uh, aid. That is, aid is being disbursed. The successive tranche of uh, an aid program are disbursed in view of the results, assuming that the result can be observed in a, uh, in, 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 in a simple way. And uh, the World Bank today is also moving toward this uh, result-based aid. Uh, also, uh, donors in general have, uh, uh, have tried to take into account uh, the, uh, <coughs> the wishes of uh, the government in uh, developing countries, uh, trying to make them more uh, uh, responsible for the way in which aid was uh, being uh, spent. There is definitely more to be, very much to be done, to be analyzed, to be researched. Uh, but uh, I would say that it is something that we cannot uh, uh, leave uh, out of the, uh, the box, the toolbox that we have to, to be able to intervene or to help on the development. And this is, I think, a set of questions that uh, uh, the research community should address uh, uh, again and again until we find something more satisfactory than what, what, we, have, uh, what we have now. But uh, aid is one aspect. Uh, another aspect is uh, by which uh, developed countries and also emerging countries, big emerging countries, uh, play a role in uh, uh, helping or uh, uh, opposing or uh, uh, obstructing uh, development is through uh, uh, trade and through uh, the way in which uh, the uh, geographical distribution <coughs> of economic activity is changing over time. Uh, th several uh, uh, speakers in this uh, symposium insisted upon the fact that, especially when we talk about Africa, uh, 
it is difficult for Africa to industrialize, uh, partly because of uh, lack of uh, competitive advantage, but also partly because of the fact that uh, uh, industrialization in uh, uh, labor intensive, uh, uh, unskilled labor intensive products uh, has uh, already been done in, uh, in Asia, and uh, Asia has become uh, the uh, center of uh, the world in terms of uh, that production. So, uh, will it be possible for uh, Africa to get in and to, to industrialize? Uh, this is not clear if we uh, uh, stay with the present uh, uh, state of play at uh, the global level. Now, what can be done? Uh, certainly, uh, uh, regional integration in Africa might produce markets which will be bigger and uh, might allow uh, local producers to exploit uh, economies of scale, which is not the case at all today. Uh, maybe uh, uh, we could uh, think about the trade preferences uh, that would be given to uh, uh, some countries in the same way. I mean, this, this already exists. You have the African Growth Opportunity Act in uh, the US and the Everything But Arms uh, program in, the, uh, in uh, Europe which uh, uh, allows uh, uh, countries to accept uh, free of tax uh, uh, African goods in uh, their markets. Uh, this probably should be uh, developed uh, more, uh, and uh, the uh, constraints in those programs, in particular the rules of origin, which are very restrictive in the case of Europe, might be uh, weakened, and this might be a way of uh, promoting uh, more uh, 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 some industrialization in, in Africa. In any case, uh, it, it, it may not be only manufacturing, as uh, it was uh, said yesterday, it may be also some part of agriculture, but uh, something has to be done uh, and uh, could be done to, to help uh, those countries. There are very interesting uh, uh, elements from that point of view. I mean, the fact that in some countries uh, we see some Chinese uh, investment in manufacturing is, to some extent, quite encouraging. And uh, maybe this will develop uh, over time. Uh, and uh, there probably are not very much we can do about it. This is uh, uh, the Chinese uh, investors are, of course, completely autonomous. But uh, making sure that uh, African countries can, uh, uh, can uh, uh, have, are equipped to, uh, uh, to uh, obtain or to, for this investment to, to take place is uh, something, something important. But in any case, this is an issue that uh, must, be, uh, must be addressed. Now, uh, together with uh, trade, we can talk about uh, an adjusted deed, uh, foreign direct investment. This is a dimension which, is, which comes with, uh, with trade. Another issue which uh, I think which, which, is, which links the global community and uh, development of, the poor of poor countries is migration. Uh, somehow we see that the unskilled labor migration are uh, at a very low level in uh, most uh, developed countries. Uh, and this is in uh, some contrast with uh, previous uh, periods. Uh, and it is something uh, uh, odd in the sense that in many of those countries there is a, a, a population problem uh, which uh, will come in the future. And uh, definitely those countries will have to rely at some stage on migration. So why not uh, starting now? Uh, but, of course, I'm talking about unskilled migration, and we see more or less the opposite when we look at highly skilled migration, where we have a lot of mobility between developing countries uh, and, in particular, the poor uh, developing countries and the rest of the world. And uh, uh, we have, uh, I mean, the brain drain is a, is a very common uh, 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 issue in the development. Uh, there is also the, the, this hypothesis that uh, it is not brain uh, drain, but it is brain gain that uh, this kind of migration benefit uh, those countries. Now, if this is the case, uh, then uh, why don't we try to uh, uh, push uh, things uh, forward and try to uh, accelerate uh, this uh, process? Uh, again, these are issues which are not really uh, uh, on, uh, on the table these days and uh, uh, issues on which uh, the uh, research community should, uh, could, 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 could do uh, much more work. So uh, it seems to me that this uh, uh, international uh, agenda is important, uh, again, basically because, uh, because of uh, uh, sovereignty, it is very difficult to intervene within uh, the domestic 
uh, sectors of the, within the governance of uh, developing countries from outside. Uh, and the only thing we can do is really to go through the uh, international uh, economic uh, relations. And uh, this is the reason why I believe this agenda is, uh, uh, is very important. But I told too much. Uh, and uh, so I uh, uh, leave. Uh, but I didn't talk so much for those <laughs> of <today. laughs> So I'm compensating. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll uh, give the floor to uh, my uh, fellow uh, panelists here. So Jean-Philippe, you want to, to, to start? Yeah, okay. I'm over. You, you have prepared the uh, yeah. You know, I never use slides. It's the first time in my life I use slides, especially <laughs> for a round table. There's a special reason for it is that I want to show a title and I want to show a table. Uh, so, but I, there are very, very few slides. So I will go very quickly, but I'll address some of the issues that uh, Francois was mentioning. So I... Okay, so the title is a, tri a tribute to François Bourguignon. Uh, go there. <laughs> so, full swing, yes, of course. I'm sorry. So, François, that's the surprise. <laughs> okay, so in, in a sense, I want to give, uh, in a very, very short time, um, a gist, the feeling of the approach that François and me are this, you know, the kind of problem that you are dealing together in our papers and that we are also continuously discussing. Okay, now, if aid is to be effective, uh, low governance countries should be left out. That's, let's start with this. You know, I want to have value for my money. Stephen Deacon, that's the expression that you use for, for defeat. So if you follow that rule, then low governance country uh, should be out. But we are not happy with that solution. Why? Because there are ethical reasons, you know, the poor country, these people in Somalia and Sierra Leone, uh, it's so, you know, they are so unhappy. They have been born in bad circumstances. I mean, uh, this is what uh, you were telling us about inequality uh, opportunities, but that applies to nations as well. So you'd like to help these people, because if you were born in Somalia, it would be, uh, you, it would be a disaster. So why not help these people? And also there are negative spillovers that are caused by their neglect. Particularly, and we see today, under the form of massive out-migration uh, from failed countries toward Europe. And there are also other kind of problems. Like, this country can become rogue countries if you left them out. You know, there will be deposit of nuclear waste, uh, drug uh, trafficking countries, uh, whatever. And there were some countries that were at risk of that, like Guinea-Bissau in Africa, etc. before they were uh, taken back into the fold of uh, uh, the aid program, etc. So there are good reasons to try. But, uh, but how do you do that? So uh, François and myself, so François, I speak on your behalf too, okay. we would say two things, you know. First, incorporate need-based considerations into the donor's objective, so that in fact the donor has a trade-off uh, between governance considerations and need considerations, since unfortunately the country which are most in need are also the worst governed. And so you say, okay, but the needs are important and you should pay attention to that, and this should be explicitly incorporated into the objective of the donor. And second, try to improve domestic governance uh, in the most needy countries. Okay, but then you could say, yeah, but governance quality is typically something which is, uh, Denis Cognier would agree with me, the outcome of long-term historical force, and therefore largely endogenous, and so you cannot change it from outside. That was what Francois was saying in a minute. Just look back at European history, and this is the table. Uh, so, but before coming to the table, <laughs> let's just, okay, no, I go to the table. So. <laughs> okay, so the idea is this, you see, you could think governance as a combination of a tradition or a legacy of decentralized economic initiative combined with an effective central state. Uh, ju just assume you have that in mind. An effective central state means it can deliver, uh, deliver peace and stability and order, but also good infrastructure and other public good like health and education, can also provide to the best possible extent independent judici judiciary system. Uh, then, you know, it says, okay, let's try to combine and say where we would have the yes, yes, uh, uh, you know, the good uh, effective state over history since the 17th, 18th century. Then I would put England, the Netherlands, Belgium, Sweden, and Germany maybe in the yes, yes thing. Uh, and uh, in the yes, no, I would put Spain, Portugal, because they never had city state, so uh, they, they had always a, a story of centralization, but much less of decentralized city. Uh, economic development, certainly Russia. 
I have put France in between. It's a little bit provoking because I am in France. Uh, because, of course, you had some city state, and Lyon was a famous city state. But you had also a disastrous event in your history, which was the revocation of uh, the Edict of Nantes by the king, which expelled so many uh, Protestant dynamic merchants from the city state. And so, uh, you know, this was a decisive point, maybe, in which France lost uh, against England. You know, not in soccer here, but uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in economic uh, uh, triggering of the revolution. Then there, you would have also this yes-no thing, where you have no state, no effective central state, but you had city-state, and Hungary and Poland come to mind. And uh, so Italy, no state there. Uh, and uh, Hungary and Poland, you know, they, they had contending uh, noble factions, uh, but they had kind of city like Gdansk, which were quite active. And the no-no is, of course, the bad scenario, and the, the, I would put the Balkanic countries there. You see, I found this is interesting, because if I had to put China somewhere, I would put it in the yes yes uh, They have a strong effective state which in a sense delivered, and they have a, a long tradition, including under the communist regime, of decentralized economic initiative that, that Russia, for instance, didn't have. So it's just to convey the point, and India probably will be an uh, ineffective central state with a lot of tradition of economic initiative. Okay, so now, uh, let me just jump. I've almost finished. Okay, now, uh, so the things is inherited, largely. Now, second, there is another problem for developing countries. No, let's no turn to the developing countries. Is that interstate competition of the Darwinian kind is not allowed to select efficient states owing to the poster international setup, which has decided that a state is a state that, that nobody can change and remove it. So it's a completely different history as compared to Europe, in which the state could disappear. And so you had to be effective to be able to fight against your neighbor. And this competition among the European states create or force the state to be more effective than maybe they could have been. Whereas, you know, the countries of Africa, they know that the diplomatic relations and the government is going to stay. I mean, just think about the, one of the most failed states of Africa, which is the, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. I mean, Kinshasa does not control much of the country, but they have their official diplomatic uh, representation in New York. Why? Because the UN has decided that it is a state. Second problem is that, that has been said uh, a lot by, by Paul Collier, abandoned mineral resource may dispense government with the need to bargain with their citizens, so there is no really countervailing power to the state. And political integration into a broader federation of nations with established rules of governance is not available. So for instance, you cannot say, uh, like you can say for Romania or Bulgaria, uh, join the European Union, they have a tradition of government, and they have rules that will get imposed on you, uh, uh, even if you think that uh, there are some defects in the way it is done, still it is important. But you don't imagine to say to Sierra Leone, why don't you join the European Union? No, okay, we agree that it's not a feasible thing. So don't, what we argue, in fact, is that it's still possible to monitor a country. Okay, don't think of changing their governance or changing their culture, I was arguing in the afternoon. I said, don't think of changing their, put, put, you know, this silly kind of thing, I will bring democracy, etc. No, forget about that. <laughs> huh? Forget about that. Just think, we will monitor the use of the money that we are giving them. And we will, you know, uh, uh, try to put effort into that. Now, the problem you could say monitoring is costly. Yes, but it may be cost effective in terms of the amount of money that reaches the beneficiary. Assume that A is the amount of aid available, C is the budget allocated to monitoring, and P is the proportion of the net amount available to the recipient country that actually reaches the target beneficiary. Then, what you have to show is just that the proportion of this amount of aid, both aid, that is diminished by the amount of the expenditure on uh, monitoring expenditure is still creating a higher proportion of that amount going to the poor or to the target beneficiary that in the end it is better than to have no monitoring at all. But that, that relationship may hold, but maybe not. So it all depends on the effectiveness of the monitoring technology. So one has to think about how do you organize do your monitoring process so that it is as effective as possible. Second thing, sanctions need to be devised and to be enforceable. Otherwise, if you are detected, and as a country you see, yeah, I have barely used my money, uh, but nothing happened, you say, why should you care? No, there are two tri uh, three tricky problems here. First, donors should not be overwhelmed by political objectives. 
And I would say this is the most important problem. That if you really look behind the motivations of many countries when they give aid, political consideration, uh, consideration come ahead of aid effectiveness consideration. I was even talking with one of the best uh, 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 development agency uh, in Europe, after England, of course, Stephen, uh, which is Sweden. And uh, I was talking with the, the head of the evaluation department and saying it's nice the way you have a systematic evaluation in Sweden. I, I would hope that in my country, Belgium, we would have the same. She said, yes, but you know, don't overestimate us. In the end, it is policy, politics that decides whether we give money or not, even in Sweden. Okay, so that's one problem. Second problem is that sanctions should avoid punishing the target beneficiary, which will automatically happen if you threaten a country by withdrawing funds or the next tranche of funds to them in case you are not satisfied with the way the, the funds have been used. That's probably one of the, also a very difficult problem. And third, of course, is that donor efforts should be coordinated. Because if you punish or, or you want to withdraw funds, but China is coming behind or, or another European country say, oh yeah, don't worry, I'm there uh, and uh, I can give you money, then the whole thing, of course, collapse. So outside pressure do work to some extent because uh, even in matters of governments, that, that, that's what uh, Francois and me would argue, because countries are sensitive to their external reputation uh, if there is a critical mass of foreign country monitoring what, uh, what they do. So a country, you cannot just think of them as being insulated from this pressure. So the whole issue is on us, is whether we as donor country, we are fragmented by geopolitical considerations and power considerations over these countries, or if we can coordinate our effort. If we can coordinate our effort, it's very hard to think that they are insensitive to that. And if a country proves to be insensitive to such pressure, then there is a good case for excluding it from aid program, even though its people will thereby be punished. I think that's a message that, uh, in a sense, uh, many of my students from Congo has told me repeatedly during my career, leave us in peace alone. This is a problem that we have to solve by ourselves. Aid is just adding to difficulties. One day we will have to chase these people in power. It will be extremely costly, it will cost blood, but we have to do it by ourselves. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jean-Philippe, for this uh, uh, presentation <laughs> <laughs> and, for, and for touring on, on my behalf. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, now I give the floor to uh, Chico Ferreira. Thanks. You know, I'm, uh, I'm usually told by people that I, I'm not very... Can you hear me? that I'm not very Brazilian, you know, I'm not very enthusiastic, and, and normally I don't mind that very much, but in this panel, I, I noticed hearing uh, Stefan uh, earlier, and Jean-Philippe now, that with this Belgian uh, contingent that we have here, I should really end it, you know, we have to uh, maybe play a little soccer together here, because uh, the enthusiasm from the Belgians is overwhelming. So let, let me, uh, with that, try to make some, some very brief remarks on, uh, I mean, it's not uh, very original. I had organized my thoughts on this international community question into aid, trade and migration <laughs> and knowledge. <laughs> I didn't come up with that. So, uh, uh, but uh, I have two thoughts on, on aid. And um, um, I, I, I do have to say, since this is being recorded, that these are purely my personal <laughs> views. Uh, and so the first one is uh, <laughs> that I'm actually a little, I lean a little more towards the Bill Easterly view of AIDS than to the Francois Bourguignon view of AIDS. Uh, although not entirely, not all the way, because the Bill Easterly goes, goes too far in my view. But just to be, be, be provocative, let me make two points. One is that we heard very compellingly from um, Paul Collier about the many dangers associated with what other people call the natural resource curse, right? Now, there are some aspects in which aid is just like that, right? It's a bunch of money that gushes out. Now, instead of gushing out of the ground, it gushes out of, you know, airplane doors, if you like, or, or bank uh, accounts, okay? But they, uh, they, like oil funds, they discourage the generation of domestic resources, mobilization of domestic resources through taxation. Uh, like oil money, they have to operate through governments. Uh, so they don't, uh, they're not money that you're giving directly to people. Increasingly, we can try and bypass it through community-driven development programs or something, but on the whole, it's still going through the governance uh, uh, process. Uh, 
Um, so uh, th they can have a number of, of, of issues, just like the natural resource rents. Uh, you know, they may lead to Dutch disease as well. They may, they may lead to an appreciation of the currency that discourages actually the competitiveness of certain domestic industries. Uh, but probably more serious than that is actually the impact, as I said, on, on the social contract in the country. The idea that a government can run paid for by other governments rather than paid for by its citizens, I think has long-term implications that is speculated on a lot, but that could be more serious than we entertain. Um, I think in large part, what's behind the continuation of aid is the feeling by good people in the West, such as uh, most of you in this room, and now I'll conveniently assume my Brazilian identity, so now I'm from the South, not the West, um, right, that, that we need, we must do something. And so since we must do something, we must give money. We have it, they don't, we, we, let's try and, and give this money. Uh, and, and I'm not sure it works very well. The, the final point I want to make on aid is, and I'll pick, pick on your model a little to, to say that you have this monitoring cost and so on. But the thing is that there's the political economy of aid has two parts. And it's not only on the recipient side that it can go wrong. It's also on the donor side, right? So people work for these ministries, right? How credible is it that they'll want to monitor how things are going? I mean, they'll say they'll monitor it. But then, you know, we do that at the World Bank. I, Two weeks ago, I was in uh, Ghana, and I went to see a project that was really, I won't go into details, but it was really a terrible project okay, that the World Bank was financing. It's clearly something we should not be doing. But it, we keep doing it. Why do we keep doing it? Because, and I sit at those meetings in Washington, because if we don't do it, that project is not dispersing, and that project has to be closed. If that project is closed, we're not spending our full IDA allocation on Africa, and we'll give some of it to South Asia. And the, the region <coughs> in, 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 it doesn't want to do that. And so the ministry in Sweden or France or Ditton will not want to do that either. They will not say, well, actually, we should stop spending half this money, and we're giving this money to the Department of Health or Social Security or to the Home Secretary to police migration. Okay? They're not going to want to do that. Uh, and so the, the political economy is, is an industry that on both sides you know, consists of people like me. I really now should, should stop this. <laughs> okay, flying around the world, so, you know, with, with an incentive to say that these things are working. All right, so that's aid. Now, I'll come back to some of that with knowledge at the end, because there I have a more optimistic message. But on openness to trade and migration, I think there the West can do a lot more than it's doing, right? And uh, trade is one. I mean, there are already AGOA and other things like that, as you mentioned. But migration in particular, there I take a view very similar to Lent Pritchett's. I don't normally agree with Lent on many things, but I will on this. You know, Lent Pritchett has this book that says, let their people come, right? So if you really want to help, okay, uh, I don't think we should, I don't think the solution, the, the, I don't think the optimal solution for aid is the corner solution. I don't think it's zero. I just think a lot more selectivity is needed and a very careful revisiting of the incentive structures on both the donor and the recipient end. The political economy of donors and recipients needs to be much more carefully investigated. It's not about monitoring the recipients, I don't think. It's about internal monitoring of the donors to a large extent, in my view, to be, to be provocative. Uh, but uh, but uh, on migration, if you, if you really want to help, then, then open up the borders more than you have so far. Now, people are not really willing to do that, right? We just need to look at a few election results uh, in Europe recently, or at the debate on immigration in the United States, to know that you don't have political support for that, okay? So there's a real issue. And there is an issue, I mean, there's much debate on the impact of, of migration on the wages of unskilled labor. There's a number of papers on the US and so on. My reading of that literature is that you know, I'm not convinced that if you let a whole bunch more of unskilled workers in, then the, the labor demand won't respond and there will be a pressure, downward pressure on wages of unskilled workers. I mean, lots of gains in other areas, but I think it's not distributionally neutral, okay? So it clashes with the domestic uh, issues of inequality as well. So you could reduce global inequality, but at the cost of increasing inequality, not amongst the residents of your country, but amongst the citizens born in your country, and in some cases of, this, of the dominant race. And those issues matter, too. So there, I think you could do a lot more, but uh, I don't think you will. OK, then let me turn to knowledge. And knowledge, I have two things to say also about, about knowledge. That's actually where I think institutions like the one I work at, the World Bank, are sometimes working well. Um, and it's not so much about the research department generating new papers or anything like that. It's when institutions like that act as clearing houses 
for practical experiential knowledge on certain problems and solutions and bring them to other countries. And there increasingly, it's not about north-south, it's increasingly also about south-south. So the bank does, and you know, I'm not even involved in those things, so it's colleagues that I can praise them at will. You know, it, it, there'll be a bunch of workshops where people who, d who did conditional cash transfers in Brazil and Mexico and so on will sit together with those that are beginning to do them now in Tanzania and Ethiopia and discuss certain things. And they're very cognizant of the problem that Paul Collier referred to in the context of the Norwegian solution. They're very cognizant that Tanzania is not prison. And so they try to think about what lessons could be learned or not, but they're also, you know, they tend to be, I think, aware that there are different circumstances. I think those things can be really helpful. There could be lots of other uh, areas. Where there are lots of other areas where that, that happens. One of them is the design of uh, uh, auctions uh, and mechanisms for allocating purchasing, uh, for allocating uh, private, public-private partnerships, where, again, uh, there's, there's uh, some lessons from Chile and other places that are shared with, with, other, with other places. Um, so I, I, I think there's a lot on the knowledge sharing and perhaps some of that can be packaged with aid and, and loans. So I, in that sense, when, when some funds are packaged together with a sharing of knowledge, I, I think it works well. A another example of that, I won't be too long, but another example of that is actually something that uh, Somebody mentioned, I think maybe it was Stefan Klassen, I think yesterday he mentioned MECOVI, this mm -hmm. statistical program, the statistical development program in Latin America, which was a partnership between the IDB and the World Bank. He just mentioned it as the IDB, but actually we were heavily involved in that as well, so I can box with that now. But that, that was a, 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 a scheme of bringing together people from statistical agencies across Latin America, often with somebody else from the outside, so somebody would come <coughs> a sampling expert or a questionnaire design expert or whatever, there would be people from the north, people from the World Bank, people from universities like uh, these guys, uh, you know, and they would come together and they would have this, these little workshops and, and it was a very productive program. And uh, some of us now in the, in the, in the Africa region left, led by our vice, vice president are thinking of doing that in a, co in a context of Africa uh, as well, trying to develop some sort of sharing of knowledge on, on, on statistical uh, capacity. So th those things, I think, can, can be quite, quite useful. Um, my, my last point on knowledge is, I'm not sure I understood what um, Stefan said when he, he had this interesting point about client orientation. And, but I think then he said something like it, lo it leads to some sort of too technocratic solution or something. I don't know, maybe I misunderstood. To me, oh, yes. I did misunderstand. <laughs> because to, to, to me, to me the, 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 the trade-off is actually between those two things. And this is a very difficult trade-off, you know. Um, I mean, client orientation, let me say something about client orientation. Client orientation, or the fact that Paul was also talking about, the fact that things are driven, and you just said, you're students from Congo, right? Things are now driven much more by the the, by the recipient or the developing country government. I think that's true. I mean, uh, and, and, and I think we, for example, at the World Bank are now much more responsive to listen to what the client is saying. That's the philosophy. That's what we get told in, in all our meetings and so on and so forth. That is clearly an improvement over colonialism, right? Or neo-colonialism, where we would come in and say, here is some paper that we read. It says this. You must do that. Okay? So client orientation is a very good thing. Except that client orientation is orientation to the client government not the client people, right? Okay, so that's, okay, so, so but then, then there is a trade-off. So you can't really go back to neocolonialism, nor can you go completely towards client orientation when client, you know, you're dealing with a dictator that has, you know, repressed his people and has, and has been reelected 15 times and, uh, you know, uh, and you're shaking hands with people who've stolen lots of money and fought in previous civil wars. I mean, these things are serious, right? So I don't know what to do about that, but there is a real, a real trade-off there where I think one role, this is my little interpretation here, one role is the role of technocracy in the sense of the little bits that we can actually find from research, external research mostly, research done by academics, also sometimes our own little research, where we say, well, the, the balance of the evidence to the extent that we can find it says this that or the other thing, and, and, and kind of stick to that in the face of um, 
of different views. So there must be a, an anchor somewhere, and I think, quote unquote, a technocratic, I, as in scientific, approach to some of these things is possible. Not because it ignores the political economy, quite the contrary, because it's the only hope to anchor aid effectively on something that is not the political economy on both sides. Okay, thank you very much, Chico. Uh, Denis? Yeah, I don't get fired. <laughs> okay, so I, I'm, I'm probably uh, not the best place to, to comment on p policy issues because I'm not working with, uh, in, uh, in the policy field, but, uh, uh, but uh, and, and I'm not representing the French government. Uh, uh, and, and this will be v very, very personal views uh, that I will be expressing. But uh, so, so uh, uh, Regarding the, 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 the question of the aid relationship, well, um, I must say I'm not, very, uh, I'm not reluctant to the idea expressed recently by, uh, by Angus Deaton that uh, aid could do more, more bad than good, uh, except that in his book, in the chapter of his book, I regret that he doesn't apply the methodological rigor <laughs> that he applies to the other <laughs> topics that he deals with in the, in, in the book that is dedicated to completely different issues that is the great escape from, uh, from mortality and, uh, and, and, and the rest. Uh, so, I, yeah, I agree with my, 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 my colleague uh, uh, panelists that, uh, uh, that the aid relationship is certainly a difficult issue. If, you, if, we, if we look at the history of, uh, of thought uh, on, on in the field of distributive justice, uh, international distributive justice is probably the least elaborated uh, uh, issue in, in the field because all the major contributions in distributive justice uh, that, that you mentioned in particular in your, in, in your speech uh, were very much dedicated to uh, the case of a constitutional state uh, trying to, to build a social contract, this is the, the idea of growth and, and, and the rest, so that one wonders, do, do we have the institutions represent one of these multilater multilateral institutions where we don't have an international state institution, so do we have the institutions to put in place international justice? And you <coughs> see a whole range in this literature between what, what is called a, a cosmopolit cosmopolitanist uh, 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 approaches where uh, all citizens of the world are, tr are treated on the same, on the same ground, and much more, uh, much less ambitious uh, 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 approaches that are very much represented by John Rawls himself, who wrote only one book on inter international justice that is called The Right of People. The Law of the People. Uh, the Law of the People. And, and that, is, that is defending a very, very, very modest approach of international uh, uh, redistribution. So adding to the, the, uh, the issue that Jean-Philippe Jean uh, uh, raised about, well, should, uh, should, we, sh should, should we punish uh, 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 badly governed uh, 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 states or, bad, or the citizens of badly governed states, I could add also that it's unclear wh whether uh, the, the citizens of those badly governed states should be held responsible in the, in the favor of equality of opportunity of, of their governance. And this is a great issue, and, and we see that the whole issue in the international distributive justice is, is, is really the interaction of the, of the basic principles that were set in a, in, a, in a national setting with the issue of sovereignty, the issue of the basic of legitimacy and, and sovereignty. Uh, so, uh, so I wanted then to, to, to make a, a few, so, and to, for instance, to illustrate this issue of, uh, of, of sovereignty, it's, uh, uh, there is always a trade-off between the extent or the, the, uh, the, uh, the sovereignty that you, that you have and uh, how much you depend from, uh, on the aid <coughs> transferred from another uh, agent, uh, for instance. And here, of, of course, the multiplicity of donors could help to some extent because you no longer depend, don't depend on, and, and this helps you also to escape the neo-colonialistic uh, 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 neo relationship. Uh, if, if, for instance, uh, French Canada would, uh, would vote for independence and, and, and secession from, uh, from, from the Federal State of Canada, it would lose the transfers associated, the federal transfer associated to this gain of sovereignty. So this is where you see that when you are in a bilateral 
uh, 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 relationship necessarily sovereignty is, uh, or you lose sovereignty if you receive uh, aid or transfer. So it's unavoidable and it discharacterizes uh, very much the neo-colonial, uh, 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 the, the, the risk of a neo-colonial neo relationship, but this is a, a bit diluted when we get a multiplicity of dollar and perhaps multilateral organization, so of course. Uh, so I wanted to just uh, to, 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 to make a, just a comment uh, based perhaps uh, on a bit of experience and also on a paper that I read about aid allocation based on outcomes that uh, Francois, Francois uh, uh, alluded to. Uh, so uh, so of, uh, regarding this approach, I would say that, as it has, in, as, as it, as it has often be, been said, that the statistical feasibility of the monitoring of, uh, 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 of, of aid allocation based on outcomes is very much debat debatable. But I would uh, like to un uh, underline another uh, uh, issue that is the political economy of numbers. Uh, and certainly there are, there are instances where uh, putting the stress on outcomes uh, make, make, uh, uh, make us run the risk of having manipulated numbers. Uh, there is a, a famous, well, there is a, a paper that, uh, that, that I found very interesting for, uh, from, from a young guy of uh, the Center for Global Development, Justin Sandefur, about, about the impact of, uh, of the Bill Gates Foundation initiative of giving, was it one dollar per, 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 per child vaccinated against, uh, uh, against tuberculosis, I, I think. Uh, and uh, so, you, so the Bill Gates Foundation said to the country, we give you one dollar per additional child that is vaccinated. And what you see in a nutshell is that in, those, in countries in Africa, you see some countries where the administrative data regarding the count or the count of children who have been vaccinated to jump all of a sudden, specifically on vaccinations against uh, tuberculosis, not on others. And, and, and fortunately, uh, we, have demo we have surveys also, we have demographic in health surveys in, in, in the country that you can compare the administrative data and when people, parents who have no, who do not receive the one dollar, because it's the government who, who, who received the, the one the one dollar uh, uh, in the first stage, they have no incentive to lie to the enumerators of the survey. They here you see no jump in, uh, 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 after the Gates initiative in the numbers of the uh, in the figures for vaccination. So you see, there is a true political economy of numbers. And, 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 and it's, uh, it's a matter of worry when you think of, uh, of pushing uh, aid allocation based on, on outcomes. Now, I, I would like to, to uh, also to, to, to uh, rebound on, on what uh, Chico was saying about the, uh, 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 producing public goods on knowledge of knowledge. And I would also uh, emphasize another dimension of that, that is information, I would say. We live a, so we live in a world of globalization, not only a globalization of trade, but also globalization of information, uh, thanks to new technology, the internet, and so, and, and so forth. And I would say that in, well, in democratized setting, we, we were uh, wondering uh, 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 not, 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 not long ago about how to change the political economy of, of countries. Uh, public, public, public opinions in African countries could be very much sensitive to the information that we provide to, to them regarding the structure of their countries. Uh, so, you, in, a, in, a, in a best, the recent bestseller that you, you did not put in, 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 in your picture, Thomas Piketty, <laughs> <laughs> uh, pledges for, a, for, a, for a, a, the building of a kind of cadastre of, uh, of uh, world, worldwide capital. So, it's a, of course, a very, very ambitious goal. But I think that it, it, it would be indeed a very useful information to the people of these countries to see what's the distribution of capital across the firms, according in particular to their national origin. Uh, uh, so I remember uh, from my past experience in, in, in the statistical production of, of the country of Cameroon, having, so I've, I've been involved in the implementation of a, of a, of a, of a survey on, uh, on the uh, industrial sector <laughs> of, of Cameroon. And at the, at the moment we were able, to, well, we were able to produce rough uh, figures of the distribution of uh, the capital uh, according to the nationality of the, of the owners. That is, uh, and at the time it was, well, at the start of the, uh, of the, of the structural adjustment programs. So uh, we had roughly cal calculated that there were 
one third, one third was belonging to the government, one, one third of the capital was public capital, one third in the in, you have a Cameroonian industrial sector, another third was domestic uh, um, private capital, and another third international uh, 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 capital held by, by the international firms. Uh, so, but after that came a wave of privatization, and, and, and I think that the picture is now uh, completely unknown for Cameroon, and, and, and I, would, I, I think that it would be a very, very useful information. Uh, I have other things to say uh, on capital flight in the week time is left, but but uh, 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 but uh, I could stop there. I, I <laughs> to, to you. Thank you very much, uh, Denis, Stéphane. Okay. Um, well, I um, I think given where I'm these days working, I should say something about aid, and um, but I want to talk briefly a few points on you know the the role of aid in the development community, but also its changing role, and I think. There, if I look forward, it won't look the same as it does now. I mean, and that, that's essentially what I want to illustrate. And I will briefly give the context why I'm saying what I'm going to say, and what it will actually mean for the development agenda. And then thirdly, I promise to say something on MDGs and SDGs, and I'll use that to round up um, some final thoughts here. So very quickly. So I think the context of it is really changing. I mean, you know, we've been doing this now, what, for more than 50 years. Um, and yeah, we've just been doing this. I mean, there's in some sense, lots of the motivation justifications seem to be often still a bit the same. They need the money, the financial, they can't go to the financial markets. Financial markets are looking very different these days. And I think that's quite something. Is this a temporary or permanent phenomenon? I can't quite judge, but it's going to take a while. QE tapering is going to, so the, the unwinding of the cure, the quantitative easing in US and other countries is going to take a while. And uh, China is there with all its uh, balances. China is there, they're players, they're player in the international community. And I think one very striking thing is a big change in the world that development is facing is actually at level of multilateral, of multilateralism, there's just an awful lot of fragmentation going on. Uh, you know, Europe is, I'm not saying imploding, but it's definitely under stress. Multilateralism in general feels quite under stress in, uh, in the things, lots more. Uh, blocks that do trade deals, you know, WTO, is that not a, is that big player and so on. So I think that changes things quite a bit, uh, also for aid. I think in the countries we're interested in, you know, and as DFID, we're particularly interested, I said this earlier, kind of, you know, these days about the 45 poorest countries, we are directly active in about 28, but that's, a bot that's the lower end of the, of the global wealth distribution in, in GDP terms. But there's growth and there's poverty reduction in quite a lot of these places. Something is going on. Maybe it's not reaching poverty reduction in the same way as we would want it. I think also there's another thing there. Many of these places do better macroeconomic management than they used to do. And I think that's one of the big successes, I would say, of development is to just actually see that uh, macroeconomic management in lots of these places, of even of things like commodity booms, it's not too bad in many of the places compared to when we go back 20, 30 years ago. So that's actually quite striking with that. But at the same time, natural resources definitely are contributing, and not just the only reason, but they're not helping. Say in Africa, what Paul was talking about it, these are messy places. I mean, a lot of developing countries, you know, Stefan Klaas, and although I know he had to leave, was saying, oh, uh, we shouldn't all start be looking at uh, fragile states. Well, if we're interested in absolute poverty, we better start learning a bit more about fragile states because more and more of them are messy places. These are the last bits in the globalization game, the ones that left left behind. You know, if as an aid agency as DFIT, we can't do but we can't but look at these more and more. And I think finally, is the change of the issues also in the global world. You know, the, the, we had it in the conference here, and it's actually been quite interesting. It does reflect, I think, what a lot of people begin to say is to do with religion. You know, ideology, ideology, it's not anymore a battle on economic things, but it has often now religious roots, social models, social norms we talked about, it, things that actually, you know, progress to make on poverty and development, female positions in, in, in societies. That's not just about aid and throwing some money at it. It's becoming very complicated things. So I think, basically, it's a very heterogeneous world within countries and across and across, uh, and across the, the developing countries. Heterogeneity in the developing world is a big thing there. 
talking about Africa doesn't make any sense anymore. There are definitely lots of countries on quite different trajectories now, some of stagnation and progress. Okay, what will it mean for aid in the development agenda? So I would first want to say I'm not with Bill Easterly. Um, you know, it's just too gloomy and too, 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 oh, it's all doomed and so on, but also what he's offering is really naive and very silly, and I'll come back to that. Um, I do think, and you know, I didn't join DFID thinking, well, actually, I didn't really think about when I joined DFID what I was going to do. But of course, you step into an organization that is spending aid, and in DFID's case, it's all grant aid. Actually, I do think that it's a much more sophisticated game of, aid, of, of trying to spend this aid than people try to portray that actually Bill and others are trying to do. is that We don't just write blindly a check because politically they're aligned with us or whatever. Okay, politics plays a role, but usually it's to actually stop the bureaucrats, or the civil servants, I should call myself, um, actually trying to do something, and the politician says no. But actually it's not the reverse, it's not the politician saying on everything that's what we're going to do, and so on. So I, I, maybe it's different, maybe we're doing... Yeah. I don't know what Sweden is. Actually, I knew that what Sweden is, that in the end, I've actually had similar conversations there. But no, it's in the end, we are driven by poverty impact. That's by law, we have to do that. It's there. It doesn't mean we do all good things and everything's there, but I'm trying to say, people try to be careful. And, and, and more and more, I'm actually quite impressed at some things. People try to be careful. Results orientation makes you think, you know, trying to actually doing, you know, even sometimes dislike the generals of value for money, but makes you, makes you, forces you to make things explicit. I think if, we, if we're doing one thing not very good, it's the same thing that I, you know, um, I, I said in the other talk. You know, we need to find better ways to do, to work in these tricky political economies, because in these places where institutional institutions are really messy, it's just really hard to do it. And we need to get better, and I think that's where it lies, find to find clever things to do, designing things. There's not going to be one model, but being very conscious of it. And that's, again, what I meant by the, 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 the client orientation stuff, is that, you know, I, I take the example that I saw in DRC with the VAT system. Some really great consultants set up a VAT, VAT system, as you would set up in Bosnia or in Turkey, for DRC. And, of course, the result, the, end, the technocratic solution that was offered, that's what I meant by the kind of naive technocratic thing, oh, how do you do VAT, or you do VAT in one particular way, and then in the end, it, it really is fueling corruption rather than doing anything positive about it. That's, and I think we don't disagree with that. But that's the thing, we can do things, but I don't want to be sounding like as if I very easily think it's very easy to do so, because I do think it is losing its relevance very fast. In lots of the countries we work in, some of the policy instruments, the policy loan instruments and so on, Things like budget support that had 15, 20 years ago quite a lot of traction to try to achieve something. If you can go almost every day, yesterday or two days ago I got a little message, it's now Kenya gone to the Eurobond market. Ghana, uh, I know it's recorded, screwing up with its economy by actually really giving away massive development process by doing silly things on the fiscal situation, but they can know they can go to the Eurobond market, they can go with the liquidity of current, current markets. It loses its relevance because it can't do policy in that same way anymore. And it's, I think increasingly we have to be conscious that that's the, rule of the, that's the name of the game when these countries get in closer and closer to middle income status, credit worthiness increases, macroeconomic management is actually quite okay, they can get a debt, but it doesn't mean they do development. They can kind of grow with this natural resources fuel growth and so on. So the non-aid agendas are really having to become more important, and we do need to find new ways of doing this. You were alluding to knowledge agendas, ideas agendas, ex and, and trying to share experience. But the models we work with, which is money plus, loans plus, start not working anymore. So I do challenge those. I think IFIs and MDBs, multilateral development banks, have a real challenge there, because it's not anymore loans and then we'll do the knowledge. No, no. Can we find a way of actually doing the dollars and the ideas without actually having to attach money to it? Now, for DFID, that's hard as well, because the non-aid stuff is crucial, but the instrument we have is grants. And we can't really, we need to find better ways of operating it. So I think it's a real challenge there. And then finally, for the aid agenda is that more and more with these countries getting richer, the justification, the legitimacy of actually writing the checks from taxpayers' money to these countries is going to go down. 
We've seen it as DFID having to be under pressure to withdraw from certain countries. But there is a legitimacy to it because increasingly there's more and more of these countries that can indeed raise their money. The capital is not scarce. They can actually tax their people but often don't do it. 1% of people in India have income tax. 1% of income taxes is in India, uh, of the people are having, uh, having to pay income tax. There are much more local things. People talk about you know, relative poverty and equality. These become much harder things to deal with from outside. They are not, aid is not a solution to inequality. I find it a really strange thing that say, oh, put inequality on the agenda, but it's not an aid agenda to deal with inequality. These are domestic processes that need societies need to deal with. Religion, the secularity versus religion-based states, that's not an agenda that, that from, uh, from outside we can come into it. The heterogeneity from, of countries becomes really much more hard. Aid will lose increasingly its relevance, and we need to think of other ways of engaging these things, because as other people have been commenting sometimes on my comments, there's a lot of poverty, relative poverty, absolute poverty in countries that are rich enough to deal with it. So how do you handle this? So finally, what does it mean for the MDGs and the SDGs? At one level, there's one thing I really like, and I don't think it's by design, is the fact that the people have been putting zero targets. So it does force everyone, whether it's DFID or international organizations or the EU or the World Bank, to actually take countries like DRC uh, um, seriously. They have to, there's something there because we can't get to these targets by 2030 unless we sort out some of these very, very poor places. Now, uh, sorting out sounds very neo-colonial. Yes. Uh, <laughs> no, I did it on purpose. Yes. Sorting out these things. It's again this challenge, but how do you do that? Because it's, it, what is the kind of way of doing it? So if you ask me how, to, so that's a real problem I find with that at the same time with the SDG, MDG agenda, because, you know, how do you engage with this? And, um, you know, Shanta, actually, recently I asked him, you know, how will we get... Uh, you know, kind of say, what would you not write this time, where even if you have to force to write it, how much will it cost to get to zero poverty? Well, he said, infinity. Because there will be places where aid effectiveness is close to zero. So it is infinity. Or another way of saying it, you could say, how much will it cost to buy of Kabila? Now, that's endogenous, because after, if you bought of Kabila, there will be the next one. That's a little bit of the flow of the more Ibrahim price, that there will always be a next one in line to actually do this. So this is really a serious thing. So, okay, where does it leave us? Well, finding some ways of dealing with it. So the final thing I would say is, you know, so I think increasingly, and I think also seeing China in that space, the universality of the whole thing or whatever, I do think that European and OECD and EU countries should actually realize in this fragmentation of these things, becoming clear what they stand for. Value-based, rule-based priorities. So not just Swedish welfare state and let's export it, because we don't have it in Britain, we don't have it in France. Um, maybe you don't have it in France, actually. Maybe you have it in Belgium. But anyway, uh, but it's actually saying, you know, what you stand for economically, politically, not in a, a, a simple, cheap human rights conditionality, a bit like Bill Easterly is proposing, a bit of Heritage Foundation meets Bill Easterly kind of stuff. I think that's too cheap. That's, 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 that's not a thing. Political conditionality and that kind of thing, it doesn't quite work and so on. It's not about cheaply exporting democracy, but it's actually being willing to, to show what you stand for. It's not about aid. It's going to be le developments. Uh, it going to, it's going to be less and less about aid, about finance. I think the big thing is going to be getting your own house in order. And meaning, actually, working as development agencies, also having development diplomats that actually trying to sort out internationally the whole rubbish with tax havens, with uh, uh, multinational uh, types of stuff, trade agendas, migration agendas, and actually moving international property rights and actually having things. I think that's the only way for OECD and EU countries to have any legitimacy to start engaging also on these political economy things, to keep on sorting out your things. So I talk too long. Thank you.